Thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring today's video. You've heard of the beauty community's never-ending drama or the tumultuous world of gamers in the gaming community niche, but did you know there's a little pocket and world for every interest? Today we explore the world of dolls. That's right, there's a community of hundreds of thousands of collectors globally. Age 6 to 60, people around the world gather both in person and online to celebrate the wonderful world of doll collecting. But life in plastic isn't always fantastic. From cyberbullying to fan wars ending in doxing, the doll community is just as dramatic as when you played Barbies as a kid. What's the psychology behind why people collect things? We'll explore this in a deep dive into what the doll community really is. In order to understand doll collecting, it's important we understand its five most notable franchises. Holla holla, Claudine and I here. Before we get started, be sure to give this video a thumbs up, turn on notifications, and subscribe so you never miss the tea on the toys you love. Now, let's dive in. Firstly, of course, Barbie, the reigning queen of fashion dolls. She wasn't technically the first ever fashion doll though. Did you know Barbie was inspired by a German novelty stall named Bill Lilly? A past life Barbie successfully keeps under wraps, but she is the longest standing doll to ever exist. Bratz, Barbie's arch nemesis, the Bratz pack is known for their sassy and edgy Y2K aesthetic with core four girls, Chloe, Yasmin, Sasha, and Jade. Monster High, the high school for legend Legendary Monsters has created a freaky fabulous fan base of those who love all things goth, geeky, and shrieky. American Girl, a line of 18-inch dolls to portray girls aged 8 to 12 with a variety of ethnicities, faiths, and social classes from different time periods. They're easily one of the most successful doll lines, with many in the line retailing at over $100, yet still flying off store shelves. And lastly, the fifth doll line? We're going to break it up into several groups, as there's many other doll lines to to mention, such as BJDs, Disney Limited Editions, Blythe, Polyp to LOL Surprise, each with a unique group of fandoms. The community varies depending on the type of doll you're collecting. Do you buy fashion dolls or do you buy porcelain dolls? The community for reborn babies may cultivate a far different community from those who collect living dead dolls. So now that we covered the basic fashion dolls, let's discuss, why do people collect dolls? It's not uncommon for kids seven to 12 to buy toys of all kinds. Dolls is a toy that almost any kid has played with at some point or another. They're fun, they're colorful, they resemble a human being, so it allows you the possibility to act out stories in a way your brain can conceptualize. But why would anyone older than 13 collect dolls? It may be strange if you're not a doll collector, but just as some people like to collect Funko Pops, Monster Energy, cans or clothing, there's a universal theme to collecting, passion, dedication, and purpose. Professor of Behavioral and Brain Sciences Daniel Krawczyk explains that collecting crosses several different species. For example, the pack rat, which takes random objects and puts them back in their nest, or the magpie bird, who's said to take shiny objects and jewelry. There are over 70 different species that have been researched to collect things, and it's theorized that during early evolution, we as humans collected as a way to survive. Our ancestors collected food, and supplies to create tools, and theory would indicate collecting may have saved our species. Obviously today, we don't really need to collect things to survive, but the human brain is naturally wired to collect and gather. Collecting is fulfilling a primitive urge that releases dopamines into the brain. Dopamines are neurotransmitters that have to do with our reward system. It's a pleasurable feeling when dopamines hit, and they're known as an addictive chemical, which could explain why collecting can become addictive and impulsive. But dopamines are naturally and serve a purpose in our function as humans. They tell our brain, this is good do it again. When we find something new for our collection, dopamines are released. Over time, our brain desensitizes. Think of the first time you tried your favorite food. It felt amazing and exciting, but over time, it doesn't give you that same excitement. You may still love it, but it isn't as satisfying, and the brain will go on to seek the next thrill. Toy companies understand this, and that's why brands like LOL Surprise are so successful, because you never know what you're going to get. It's difficult to become desensitized because the urge to find find ultra rare and valuable dolls is strong. It's exciting when you finally find a hard to find doll and it makes you wanna buy more and more to keep having that rush. 
In addition to these psychological tidbits, humans are known to take value to an extreme like no other known species, willing to sacrifice high stakes for things we deem valuable. For example, this frozen hair is set that sells for $10,000. Though what do we define as value? Is it just money or can it be something more? There's something deeper and more meaningful to collecting depending on who you ask. For some, it's an investment and they're collecting in hopes they can resell in the future. For some, it's the thrill, the hunt of finding something rare. For some, they collect as a way to bond with family. It's something they do with their boyfriend or parent and pass down through generations. For some, it's the memory that's associated with a certain product, like something you loved as a child or a reminder of a past loved one. But one of the most common themes of collecting as any hobby is unity and belonging. Collecting has a tendency to attract like-minded individuals who have similar interests. That's why the doll community exists, because people who love the same thing tend to form a bond and friendship over it. Krawczyk explains that this bond releases oxytocin. If you don't know, oxytocin is known as the love chemical, but it's not exclusive to romance. This neurotransmitter is released in the brain when we hug someone, when we're cuddling, or when we're surrounded by like minded individuals. When we go to conventions like Comic-Con and meet people who share our interests, our oxytocin is heightened and we continue to associate that good feeling with the things we love, with our collections. So basically, people collect because it feels good, but it isn't so black and white. I've asked a few of my doll collector friends to explain why they collect dolls for themselves. I feel like it's been forever when I started collecting. It's been centuries. <laughs> I've been into dolls since I was a baby. I got my first Barbie when I was two. For me, it's been almost, gosh, since like 1995, 1996. I remember like my entire life collecting like dolls without realizing I was a collector. Well, technically I've been displaying them and into collecting since I was a teenager, a tween even, like maybe 12 or 11. My first doll was Tea Party, my first Tea Party Barbie, the Hispanic one. So I started collecting dolls, I think when I was collectively on my own money, I think I was 18. We didn't have a lot growing up. I always asked for dolls. And my absolute favorite doll when I was a little girl was my ballerina Barbie. My mom sold the house and in selling the house, she threw out all of our toys that were in the attic without ever asking us. And I was just devastated. I was like, Valerie to Barbie! Over the years, doll collecting for me has definitely evolved and changed. Obviously when I was really little, to me, I was just collecting dolls and just to have them. They were just so pretty. They were little like play things. And now as I've gotten older, I still, play with them in the extent that I pose them, I put them on my shelves. Dog collecting is, is more than a hobby, I think, for many of us. I think for a lot of people, doll collecting becomes a form of therapy. No, I no longer consider myself a collector because they're my tools for work. Um, in retrospective, I guess I would say that I loved going to a store and seeing the dolls on shelves like it was a museum and then deciding which one I wanted to take home that day. I don't know, that was like kind of therapeutic to me for like my entire childhood. Now, because I am in the repainting realm of doll collecting, most of the dolls that I collect is for canvas reason. Like I would get tons of Barbies, I would go and find uh, doll lots on eBay and just buy them all. Uh, One thing about doll collecting is it's, it's a way to get out of the reality of, because you know, life sucks, but dolls don't. But to me, they're just like a fun little innocent escape from uh, the turmoils of life, we'll put it that way. I really like to open them up and touch them and play with them and like I actually love the plasticity of the dolls if that makes any sense. It's such a strange object if you think about it because there is no other object that has absolutely no use that you can actually manually do so much with it. I love fashion, I love art, and then the shoes. Girls like shoes, guys like shoes, we want to see the fashion. I'm not into, um, you know, like shoes or handbags or anything like that. I'm not into art. I'm just not into that stuff. But when I see a beautiful doll, it just, it just, it sparks joy, you know? I just get this feeling. Dolls, to me, it's not only something that is very aesthetically pleasing, but it's also something that is just, come on, they're just stunning. We'll just put it that way. Dolls are just stunning. I would say it's like collecting art. Like, I, like, they're like mini fashion statues, even though I can't wear mosquito, my dolls can. Over the years, quality of dolls have definitely, definitely, definitely changed. There's conversations with Mattel and um, MGA, where Mattel is giving you the diversity and inclusivity, but with no fashion. 
we want to see ourselves, right? But we want to see ourselves elevated. Dolls are supposed to be elevation, not supposed to be, you know, regular basic. And we can we can get that at Walmart. <laughs> we, can, we can see that walking down the street. I think that it's so important to have diverse dolls. So to me, it's so important because for me growing up, rats were a way to feel um, like I belonged. If it was a makeup line, people would be going wild if you did not have an entire range of skin tones and all these things. Uh, coming from definitely collecting in the 80s and 90s and even in the 2000s, we had such you know, textures and fabrics and hair that was up to the sky. You know, dolls are more expensive to produce at the quality that we once had years ago. People just really bashing uh, the doll collecting community and feeling like they get attacked a lot. I don't know if it's because I'm so much older than most people in the doll collecting community and maybe they're afraid to upset grandma. I don't know, but I don't really have that experience too much. I've had very positive experiences in the doll community because I come from a time where there was not social media and the only way to really interact with doll people was going to either doll conventions like doll expos. Drama, but I love it. I'm here for it. Barbie mm. people and Bratz people are forever gonna go at it. Let's just, and especially because Mattel and MGA, they they do that too, you know? It probably, it's gonna last for, for a long time. Um, I do love the competitiveness that Mattel and MGA has because it leads to more dolls, you know? The people in the doll community are people going actively into this community when they want to unwind and when they don't wanna think about whatever their real life problems or job is. And sometimes when, there is something that is not what they want in terms of like a doll or a person saying something against their opinion. That kind of like becomes personal. Yeah, a lot of people, I feel like as a doll community, there's such a divide when it comes to who you stand. And I stand any doll, <laughs> any doll. It's a, it's a free world and I feel like it's, it's just more. with the doll community has really been nothing but positive. I think that it's a group of people who understand each other. The doll community is such a vast world that not a lot of people know about. Specifically for me, for the doll repaint world, we get inspiration from drag queens, cosplayers, you know, manga, comic books. And I feel like it's so, so cool to see someone who loves doll, who also loves drag. Someone who loves doll, who is a fan of comic books. Going into now the world of social media though, it's been so much fun. I've met some of my closest, dearest friends through the doll world. So in general, for the most part, <laughs> my doll experiences in the community have been pretty good. It's fun when we have our own kind of like helping each other out in social media. Like, hey, where did you guys see this doll? I need to find this. Shout out to Dolly La the Dolly Llama on Instagram. They would put up all these images of Barbie in different face molds and different paints that Barbie has been through. And as a repainter, that, that helps. When Monster High first came out, my child was around six or seven. It was very clear to me that uh, Caden was a different kind of kid. I had been a very different kind of kid and Monster High came out and it was just like, you know, we started collecting Monster High and through collecting Monster High and the internet, we became part of the doll collecting community. I have made such amazing friends. How on earth would you and I ever be friends and be so close? if we hadn't met through Monster High. You know, I met Elvira through Monster High. I've met so many wonderful people through doll collecting. The bigger picture is that it's a very creative community. For some reason, in some way, in some part of their lives, they feel like they did not belong. I feel like the doll community becomes this place where you can create your ideal world because it's not you um, ex explicitly on it, but it's your dolls and, and the way your dolls bring conversation and friends. Like like you know on YouTube like, like a lot of reporters would go to doll people houses and I feel like the narrative that they definitely try to form is that these are weird people they don't say that but it's definitely like they're so obsessed like you said hoarders I feel like a lot of people who don't collect dolls do have a negative perception of people who do collect dolls. They think that we're wasting our money. We're not freaks. I feel like people uh, usually think, you know, how there's this stereotype of like the guy with like the, with the action figures and he's just like a nerd and a creep and whatever. Those are the stigmas is that people are like very weird and strange and, and obsessed. I know so many teenagers and young adults 
come to me in comments and in DMs and tell me that their parents tell them to throw out their dolls. Parents have thrown out their dolls. I know what that's like. And that their parents have really like, like thought there's something wrong with their kid because their kid still wants to collect dolls. And they think like, why won't you grow up? Why are you still playing with toys? And they don't understand that at some point, the, the playing with dolls goes from playing with dolls to um, they become a piece of self-expression, that they become, they're not a toy anymore. It's something else. And I think a lot of parents don't get that. It's just dolls. It's not that big of a deal. And that, I think that's why we have our own pages so that we can tell the stories that we want to share. We have our own narrative. Why is it cool to have an action figure, but not a doll of the same freaking character? Like people think that we are loners or we have no personalities outside of doll collecting when many of us are talented artists, fashion designers, mothers, um, content creators. We're into all different types of things, not just dolls. Uh, dolls are just the source of our inspiration. All right, now that we understand why people collect, let's discuss all the subculture within the doll community. Much of the doll community is comprised of artists and creatives. It's expressed through various art forms like stop motion animation, in which doll collectors use their collection to tell stories through music videos or scripts. It's essentially bringing the doll to life, which is exactly why I did stop motions, to tell stories. Other artists like to repaint dolls. It's one of the biggest phenomenons within the doll community. Doll repainting is a popular art form in which artists take messed up dolls and revitalize them into something new. Like YouTuber Hexion, who repaints dolls into cartoon characters and superheroes in his own unique style. These repaints can sell for hundreds on sites like Etsy and are known as OOAK, or one of a kind, because no two repaints can ever look exactly alike since they're hand painted. Some artists digitally draw their dolls in a more traditional art form such as sketches, like Darko Dark, who now works for companies like Mattel and MGA thanks to his impressive skills of drawing franchises like Barbie and Monster High. My friend Sorovic underscore designs who creates couture-like sketches of various characters or Mookie Tunes who has a more stylized approach. Most common and popular within the doll community though is photography. Doll photography is a quintessential to the modern day doll collector. It's a universe of its own in which photographers use dolls as their models, but it goes far beyond just taking photos. This requires master level skills of digital editing to perfect. Oftentimes dolls photograph flat and in order to bring the stories of photographer is telling to life, doll photographers amplify the CGI backgrounds and makeup. Other artists like to make doll-sized backgrounds and sets and even create handmade outfits for their dolls, hand-placing crystals onto miniature dresses and hand-stitching tiny purses. This can sometimes take days, weeks even, from start to finish. Editing doll photos isn't as easy as just clicking buttons. It takes skill to use software like Photoshop, but it also takes taste and an eye for fashion to know when your editing is beginning to look sloppy. Doll photography has a rich and deep-rooted history in the doll community. Before Instagram, doll photographers took to websites like Flickr to share their photos. It was a world of its own. Doll collectors anonymously sharing photos of their dolls as an escape from the troubles of school or work. Just as anything anonymous, this made way for lots of drama. When you can hide behind a screen, it's easy to bully and harass others. But before I discuss that, eventually doll photography moved from Flickr to Instagram around 2015. This transition made doll photography more accessible to people who didn't care about dolls. And this leads me to my next topic, the stealing of doll photography. This has become a big problem for the doll community because as I explained, these photographers invest hundreds into cameras, lighting, and software, thousands into dolls and materials to dress them, and hours of hard work to create the visual story they're trying to convey. Yet people refuse to credit doll photographers when reposting their photos on Instagram, or even going as far as to use their photos on phone cases, t-shirts, and profiting off of someone else's work. You may I think this isn't all that serious, but it's a form of art theft, and legally, it's an intellectual property violation. Many of these people stealing photos claim they found the photos on Google. Well, finding a photo on Google doesn't mean it's up for grabs. This was at peak back in 2019 when the Bratz Challenge was a booming success. Companies like Forever 21 and Dolls Kill reposted Bratz Challenge photos and would tag makeup artists who did the Bratz look, but wouldn't tag the Bratz photographers who took the doll photos they were inspired by. It was devastating to the art behind these photos, seeing artwork they spent hours creating going viral with absolutely no credit. We don't talk about the Mona Lisa without recognizing it was painted by Leonardo da Vinci.
Vinci. We wouldn't recognize the Starry Night without crediting Vincent van Gogh, so I urge people to ensure they're crediting these artists properly. Circling back to the drama that derives from the anonymity of the doll community, kids looking for an escape from reality or adults enamored with fashion and fantasy. And while the doll community can act as a safe space, the normalcy of being anonymous can plague the community with bullying and abuse. Unlike the makeup community, which requires you literally show your face as you're using yourself as a canvas, people in the doll community can become popular without ever even giving out so much as a first name. Famous YouTubers like Cookie Swirl C only really show their hand, and many popular doll Instagram accounts only post photos of their dolls. This isn't a problem because the focus is on the product, but it also means people can hide behind a screen and behave however they like. Unfortunately, since the doll community is so stigmatized and judged by outsiders, people sometimes hold great shame about collecting dolls and are afraid to share photos of their face. It's not uncommon to have friends for years in the doll community that you talk to literally every day for hours on end. They become your best friend. You watch movies together. You talk about crushes. You buy things online together. But you may never even know what they look like or their real name. Sometimes people will find out a person's identity or a person in a friend group begins to feel safe enough to be vulnerable and share a face photo. But then drama strikes. The friend group gets into an argument and suddenly people are blackmailing you and threatening to tell your friends from school you collect dolls. This is especially difficult for kids within the LGBTQ community because being exposed as a doll collector may cause fear it will turn into exposing your sexuality. Since for many boys, it is stereotyped that you must be gay if you collect dolls, which isn't true, but adds a layer of distress. So naturally, when we feel threatened as humans, we get defensive. And many people in the doll community live in constant defense mode, constantly ashamed of their interest, constantly feeling a need to protect their identity. And this much stress begins to project outward. People who feel ashamed that they're doll collectors or feel they need to protect a part of themselves have a tendency to attack others before they have a chance to be attacked. Bullying others outwardly and making fun of their photography, using their identities and interests against them and undermining them as individuals. This is the dark side to the doll community and causes issues with self-esteem, depression, and a dissociation with dolls. I'd like to share a story of my own. I've been brutally bullied in the doll community. I have felt outcasted, alone, and isolated. I have traumatic experiences of things that have been said and done to me by other doll collectors, but it isn't as black and white. I've said awful things, done awful things as well. I've contributed to the dark side of doll collecting, and I think it's important we learn to reflect on our past behavior and actions without judging it, rather accepting reality. Psychologist Brene Brown often discusses the effect of shame on the brain. Shame can actually shut down the part of our brain that fuels growth, meaning when we feel ashamed, we are quite literally stunting our growth. This isn't to say shame isn't natural. We all feel ashamed of things from time to time. But the alternative to harboring shame for our past actions is by taking accountability and accepting it will come with consequences. Learning to not be ashamed of our interests and passions requires understanding why we love what we do, surrounding ourselves with like-minded individuals and finding gratitude in our passions and how they can make us feel life is worth living. I open the mic to all of you on my Instagram to share with me how you describe the doll community. Here are a few of the responses I received. Some of you describe the doll community as comforting and inclusive. Another shared fun, informative, unique, understanding. A place where I don't feel weird for my hobby. A place with people like me. A great place for people who love to collect toys and dolls. It's a great community. Not to jump from inspiration to a negative, in order to understand what the doll community is, it must be discussed. Fan wars. Much like sports teams, doll collectors become very passionate about the franchises they love. Some sports fans are so passionate about their favorite teams, they break cars, beat up other teams, and riot. Well, when you disagree with collectors of some franchises, they can get just as angry, going as far as to dox other doll collectors and harass them for disagreeing. Some of the most notable rivaling fans are Bratz versus Monster High. The MGA model is set up different from Mattel's, and they both attract fans that are in line with their respective franchises franchises. Comparing two doll lines can cause a war, and since the doll community is made up of many ages and people, there can be a level of immaturity when it comes to disagreements. As opposed to using I statements, if someone disagrees, instead of saying something like, it's not my personal style, but I can see why you'd enjoy it, it may look like that is the ugliest doll ever, and you're delusional if you think otherwise. Brat stands refer to Monster High stands as lovers of 
Creature High as a way to mock the franchise. Other punny insults arise from these fandoms, and today they're mostly found on Instagram and Facebook. On Instagram, there are many accounts which share anonymous confessions, such as at dollboy.29, who frequently shares confessions about the doll community, opinions of certain doll lines, and various other doll-related thoughts. This can lead to battles in the comment section of whose opinion is right or wrong, but that's a little different on websites like Facebook. Just like Instagram, heated discussions are had on Facebook groups, but there's a little less anonymity on this platform. It seems that Facebook attracts a more mature audience, while Instagram and TikTok are saturated with the younger demographic of the doll community. Within all these platforms, doll collectors share photos of their favorite dolls, new purchases they found, where you can buy and find new dolls, as well as selling and trading on these platforms to complete one's collection. On the flip side, many long-lasting friendships are made from these platforms. I'm still friends with many people I met digitally through our shared love of dolls, and now that we're older, We've had the chance to meet in person several times, and being in person is an experience like no other. Something essential to doll collecting is doll hunting. This is when you go from store to store trying to find a particular doll, oftentimes something that's just been released or something limited edition. If you're a Disney fan, for example, doll hunting can look like waking up at 6 a.m., heading to your local Disney store during the drop of limited edition doll, and fans may wait hours in line to get the 17-inch Ariel doll, the same way one might do if you wanted to get a new drop from the Supreme store on Fairfax. For other doll lines like LOL Surprise, this looks like driving from Target to Target, trying to find one that actually has the new product in stock. It's a fun pastime that's even more memorable when you have friends who collect dolls that can tag along for the ride. Other forms of doll hunting are going to swap meets or thrift stores. Sometimes dolls worth upwards of $500 can be found at Goodwill, because people don't always realize how valuable a doll can really be if kept in good condition. But this doesn't mean just because you find a doll at a thrift store means it's valuable. Like anything that's worth a profit, it will attract people who don't always have the best interest for the community that can ruin the fun for everyone. A pet peeve of most doll collectors is scalping and reselling, which can be defined as a person who doll hunts with the sole purpose of buying up the entire stock and selling it online for three to four times the retail value. This inflates the price and it leaves fans angry and frustrated as they can't find their favorite dolls. But what many fans may not like to hear is it takes two to tango. Nothing has value unless we give it value. So technically a scalper can charge $500 for a doll all they want, but at the end of the day, it's the buyers that make a price skyrocket. If you're willing to pay $800 for a doll, why wouldn't a seller desperate for money try to push their item to sell for that same price? The solution isn't simple, because supply and demand has been around since the dawn of time. But if as collectors we don't want something to be sold for exuberant prices, we have to stop paying them. But the drive to experience that dopamine hit is strong, and people are sometimes willing to max out their credit cards to get the doll they really want. Let us know below, what's the most you've ever spent on a doll? I think the most I've spent is $800 on the 17-inch Frozen Elsa doll back in 2016. After my house flooded, unfortunately, I had to sell her after only a month of owning her. I guess you could say I had to let it go. Other essential components of the doll community are doll next top model competitions. It's a fun way for doll photographers to sharpen their skills and have a weekly goal to look forward to. Doll competitions is like the American next top model or RuPaul's Drag Race of the doll world. A fan creates a competition as the host, asks a few friends to be judges, and holds an audition where people submit headshot photos of their dolls to snag a spot in the competition. These competitions can sometimes last months and can buy up a lot of a collector's time. They were more prevalent back in the 2010 era of collecting, but they still happen on Instagram from time to time. Aside from Instagram, one of the biggest platforms for doll collecting is of course, YouTube. YouTube serves as one of the biggest marketing platforms and gathering spaces for doll collectors. The fandoms turn to YouTube for doll reviews to decipher whether they want to add a doll to their collection, or maybe they just want to entertain themselves with an unboxing, repainting, crafting, or funny stop motion. Don't act like you haven't watched Urban Monster High at some point. YouTube has changed the way every product is marketed, but it certainly revolutionized the doll community because it paved way for our hobby to become profitable in a way that doesn't require we sell off our collection or own a toy store. Dolls is one of the few things that makes me feel alive. I've discussed the doll community and why others collect, so I'll finish us off with why I collect. 
I grew up feeling alone, isolated, the youngest of six siblings, yet I felt like I was always me, myself, and I. At age three, I was infatuated with The Little Mermaid and wanted to own all the Disney princess dolls. I loved taking baths with my Ariel and watching her hair flow majestically under the water. As I got older, I was made fun of for having Ariel dolls, but I didn't know why. My mom never, ever acted as though it was strange a boy wanted a doll, so I never thought anything of it. But then I started going to school and societal norms taught me what I was and wasn't allowed to do. So I shifted from dolls into Pokemon and I was obsessed with Pokemon. I had every Sinnoh region Pokemon card you could think of. Countless plushies, duplicates of games. I even got cardboard store displays from GameStop and Walmart. Collecting has always been in my nature, but I knew I still loved dolls. I was just too ashamed to buy them. When I turned 10, Monster High was released and my brother suggested I check out the website after seeing commercials about it. I was enamored. It was like gothic brats and I had no idea it was a doll line. That was until I saw them at Walmart one day. I fell in love with the characters' punny names and personalities, the way they could pose in so many ways which would allow me to make so many stories with them and express various emotions. I told my sister I wanted to get my niece one of them. Secretly, it was just for me. She still lived with my parents during that time, so I got to keep them for myself in secret and pretend they were hers. During that time, I really struggled with my sexuality. I was horrified my family and classmates would find out I was gay, so I had a secret identity online. Claudina 9, who was amassing millions of views on YouTube, and 10-year-old Matthew with the moppy hair and skinny arms, always getting kicked in the stomach at parent pickup, picked last in gym class, and teased by others for my high-pitched voice, got to become an online superstar with my doll stop motions. When I got home from school, I immersed myself into the world of Monster High. It was the secret school I got to attend when I made YouTube videos. Because the dolls are fully posable, I realized I could make stop motions with them and tell stories. I wrote stories about the times I was bullied, or had an argument with my sister. I used the insults people said about me and made them into villains in my plot lines. It was cathartic for me, and by 11 years old, I was paying taxes. When I turned 12, both my mom and dad were constantly in the hospital. My dad was diagnosed with congestive heart failure and MG. He was in the hospital for several months. Eventually, it seemed his condition wasn't getting any better, and hospice came to walk us through planning for his death. I started skipping school to see him in the hospital every day, so I missed half of seventh grade. Honestly, Honestly, it was less stressful because I didn't have to worry about pretending to be straight. At the hospital, there was this garden with a gazebo and fountain. So I took my YouTube money and invested it into more expensive cameras. And when I'd visit my dad, I'd go outside after visiting hours and take pictures of my dolls in this garden. In that garden, taking photos of these dolls, it was like all my life's troubles had disappeared. No more worrying about hiding that I'm gay. No more grieving the fact my dad was dying. No more trying to put on a happy face for my mom as she struggled to be the glue that kept everyone together. It was just me and my dolls. It was a miracle and my dad recovered and was sent back home. He survived his time in the hospital, but then my mom was admitted shortly after. My parents were all I had. They're the only people in the world who fully accept me for who I am. And watching them constantly suffer illness made me fear I'd lose the only people in my life who I could depend on, except my dolls. In 2016, I shifted more into the makeup community. I was told dolls aren't digestible for a wide audience and I should try posting more makeup content instead. I blew up. I was in a Shawn Mendes music video. I did a little reality show on Snapchat. I even got invited to Lady Gaga's makeup launch and met her, but I felt like I was a puppet. I literally went from collecting dolls to feeling like one. So I gave it all up and decided to make the content that I really enjoy creating, doll videos. They aren't real. I know they aren't alive and I don't spend hours talking to them or anything like that. But through the storytelling the designers share through these characters, it made me feel like I could get through this. I could use these dolls to share my stories. I could express the pain I was feeling and turn it into laughter. I still use doll photography as a way to metaphorically represent the things I feel. Like this photo is meant to represent how having to bite my tongue and needing to filter how I feel is like suicide. I risk social lynching. Or this photo, which was meant to represent the way fans can sometimes be blind to logic and follow the hive mind mentality of whatever they read online. Dolls are easier than having a human model. They're way more colorful and expressive, so I doll collect because it's truly the only consistent thing in my life. I've lost everything this year. I'm all the ways across the country from my parents. My ex-boyfriend left me. I fired the team I worked with after I deleted my Instagram. I'm grieving. I'm hurting. But still, I have the dolls I've dedicated my time to collecting and creating content around, and they're a reminder of my resilience. 
As I mentioned earlier, thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring today's video. Squarespace is the perfect online platform to create your own website, and obviously as a doll collector, I chose to create a fan website for Monster High. You can create members-only content, manage your members, send email communications, and leverage audience insights, all on one easy-to-use platform. If you're looking for a user-friendly platform to create a website, Squarespace is the only way to go. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash Claudina9 to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. If you enjoyed today's video, you'll love all my other videos discussing dolls, so don't forget to give this video a thumbs up, turn on notifications, and subscribe so you never miss the tea on the toys you love. Thanks for watching. See ya!